Hi, Sue. Good to see you. Sorry. Hi, Aaron. How are you? Good, good, good. Can I um, just see if I'm using a different computer than normal? So can I see yes. if I can share my slides? Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Does it look okay? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. And we'll just get out. One more back. How's everything for you? Uh, good. I'm still in China and think, yeah, things are good. Good. How about in San Diego? Um, it's really busy. It's just, it's too busy, but, but it's good busy, you know, it's, um, um, I'm vice dean of research now for the school of medicine. So there's a lot going on. Um, so like our vice dean for research sort of decides like what to do with COVID and things like that. Do you, mm, or, or, is that what you have to do? No, I don't have to do that. I'm a more, um, I'm, Grateful. I wouldn't end up. No, this is more. Um, I'm leading the strategic plan for basic and translational research, and dealing with retentions, things like that. But not those sort of detail. You no, know, I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> oh, got it. Yeah, thanks for giving a talk. This has been a fun uh, seminar series. Yeah, you've put a lot of work into it. Um, it seems like it, but not. It's just not not too much. It's just um, just staying on top of things. It's almost nine o'clock there. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we didn't change time, so uh, today's a little, a little bit easier. There's been great um, San Diego representation on NeuroZoom, lots of UCSD and scripts and soft speakers. Great. Um, it, it's good that we're doing that. I mean, there's great neuroscience here, but you know, we don't even see each other anymore because COVID, you know, I think mm -hmm. about, I haven't been over to scripts for, I used to go weekly and it's been a little while. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ninja. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Sue. Hi, how are you? Good, good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Great to see you online again. We last time we met in Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah, it's it seems like. The last 18 months has been forever, right? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. changed the, the entire world. Mm. Yeah. Really? Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, traveling in, in states have, uh, have been resuming to normal level, right? Today. As of today, so they say. So mm. um, I hope... I hope that's, I mean, this is for international people now mm -hmm. and domestic it's, you know, they cut so many um, planes that uh, cut out enough flights that they're always sold out now. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're going to add some back, but, um, but it's not really normal yet. It's really, everybody still wears masks and yes. it, it's, still problematic but yeah the, um, 
Aaron and I are traveling in, in China. So we yeah. <laughs> more or less free to travel within China, but uh, it's extremely difficult to do international. Yeah. We can go out, we cannot come back. <laughs> yeah. The, the contract, contact tracing here is pretty good uh, or pre pretty thorough. So I, I went to Beijing last week and then like a few hours after I got back, um, my, my apartment complex called me and sort of knew what train I was on, what platform I got off of, what city <laughs> Beijing I was in. And this was like verifying that with me. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a little scary. It's a little scary. <laughs> um, it's a lot scary, but it, but it's, it is what it, it's the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Aaron, shall we test our... PPT? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah please. You're yeah. Uh, first speaker, ming -Jia, so please, please share the okay. test, test, uh, test, uh, test sharing. Yeah. Hmm. Does it work? Mm. Uh, coming. Yeah. Ah. Uh, there is a line, right? We only yeah. see half, the left half. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I stop, I reach here again. Okay. Hello. Hi, it's long. Hi, Hi it's long. I'm in here, Sue. Nice to see Hi. you. Does it work? Um, it's, just... it's yeah. Okay. Yeah. It works. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah. It works, but it's, I cannot flip them anymore. You can't what? Oh, click on the actual screen itself. Like you have to go back to back to the PowerPoint. Mm. Yeah, then you and then you can, can now. Can you advance it? I cannot. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's working. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I should uh, stop share first, right? Yes, please. Yes, mm. please. Mm. So it got super cold in Shanghai starting yesterday. Yeah, it's chilly. <laughs> it's, yeah. I did. You'll come back. You'll come I, back to uh, uh, normal fall uh, weather like next week, something. Okay. How cold is super cold? It was four degrees uh, Celsius. Celsius. Yeah. So like my kids got up, were wearing shorts. Um, <laughs> and riding their bike to school, I said, you're going to be cold. And they said, no, it's fine. And then they came back and they said, we'll never do that again. So I think that was a good <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Good I had case. to get out my winter hat. I've never, and things like that. Hi, Aaron. Hey, Tamomi. Hey. Hi, Tamomi. Hi, Susan. Hi, how are you? Good. I just thought that I better show up myself occasionally. How's Tokyo doing? Oh, it's actually the situation is a lot better now. There are less than 100 people positive all over the country. So everyone's out now. Well, so people are wondering why suddenly there is a dramatic drop in Japan. I know. That's what everyone's talking, but nobody knows the, <laughs> the mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> it's going, yeah, it's just, <laughs> happens. It would just go away. Yeah, well, I don't know. The virus decided to stay away from Japan. <laughs> Something with sushi. Yeah, possible. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hypothesis. Yeah, but who knows? We are you know, a lot of people coming in, so we, yeah, yeah. So people are getting ready for the next wave. Is there still a quarantine? Um, they keep changing the rule. The most recent one, if you're completely, you know, you have all the certificate, everything, probably only three days. Oh, even for me? Like if I wanted to come? I don't know. I need to check. <laughs> okay. I told you. They I, keep heard, I heard if you have an invitation from one of the institutes university, I think you are free to go. Is that right? That's just what I heard. Because okay. I have a collaborator in Kyoto. So oh, that's what I, would I can write an invitation to everyone then. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
Yeah, don't, forget, don't cool. forget me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> How's everybody? Hey, Ming Jay. Hey, hi, hi John. How are you? Oh, good to see you. Yeah. Ming Jay. Hey, 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 Kong. Good to see you. Yeah. Kong, you're not in your Tesla. What happened? <laughs> I, you, you don't want to know, like, I, I, I got in the car this morning and it stinks. I think there's a dead animal trapped in there. Have you ever, have you ever like heard of such things? Is the bottom of the car like open or something in some way? We've had that. Mice can, mice can make nests inside cars. I, I, I can't believe yeah. it. I, I was blaming it on my, on my 13 year old, but it wasn't him. <laughs> it's probably your 13 year old, actually. <laughs> I see you. Good to see you again. We were just at the McKnight meeting together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had total FOMO. I missed the McKnight meeting this year because, you know, I wasn't allowed to travel. So, what? Really? Well, actually, we got clearance to travel, I think, the day the meeting started. But that's right. That's right. Talk to Eileen. I just, I just had, I'm, I'll go next year, but. Yeah, I was, I was really kind of bummed. Such a great meeting. This is a real, the first in-person meeting for like over two years for me. So. Yes, yes, yes. We, we, we don't know in, uh, so worried. Uh, I think Aaron and I are worried that uh, next year's GRC meeting, what's going to happen? We'll, we'll see. Inter- yeah. yeah, for international yes. travelers, I think. Got to be. I, we got to be back to normal I, next spring. I mean, I this- think it all, yeah, whether me, Jen, or I can get there will be another question. <laughs> I think there will be a thing there. We're sort all of right. trapped here. Right. It's going to be on the beach in, uh, where is it, Aaron? Um, Ventura Beach, California. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mo- right, most likely, so I, mean, I think uh, anyone from the- China would not be able to go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, so long. maybe we'll get started. So um, hi, everyone. Welcome to another week of NeuroZoom. Um, new time in Asia, so 9 a.m. today. We didn't turn the clocks back. And looking forward to great talks from uh, Mingjie and Su. And before we get started with those, just to um, announce that we have uh, next week, we're going to have uh, just a reminder, again, 9 a.m., in Asia, and we have Wei Xiang from Tsinghua University talking to us about hearing, ultrasonic hearing. And we're going to have a talk from Chiu Fu Ma, who will <clears> talk <throat> to us about uh, neural circuit mechanisms of acupuncture. And um, then just looking uh, forward, we, we have really cool talks coming up from great speakers. In addition to Wei and Chiu Fu, we have um, Shang Dong Fu, we have Viviana Gradinaro. Uh, e Rao, even we have uh, Hailan Hu. So the next few weeks are going to be um, super exciting, cutting edge science. So keep tuning in and keep letting me and Zalong know if you'd like to present your work. Okay, so um, Ming Jia is up first, and Zalong, uh, can you please introduce him? Okay, uh, welcome to uh, uh, our exciting uh, New Zoom November. So excuse me. It's my really um very exciting to uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce our great colleague, uh, Professor Mingjie Zhang. So as uh, Mingjie startup has his bachelor degree in Fudan. So after uh, uh, bachelor degree, he went to uh, Canada has a PhD in Calgary. So after very short like one year postdoc, he's starting uh, his career in Hong Kong University for uh, Science and Technology, uh, USD, starting from assistant professor to full professor. So Mingjie starting from a, a working as a structural biologist to uh, uh, like to elucidate the structure of uh, uh, the fine structure of a staph protein. But within uh, a decade also, so Mingjie has a, a series of outstanding, amazing discovery about uh, how to uh, how the uh, phase transi- transition uh, implicate in the uh, fine organization of within the uh, tons of hundreds of molecule uh, proteins within the uh, the tiny 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 um, snaps. Which is really uh, amazing. So uh, I'm very happy to have Minjie with us. So Minjie moved to a new position last year, uh, this year, last year. So SASTEC is a southern uh, China of, uh, of um, science and technology. It's a very exciting new position. Uh, we, we hope Minjie have starting a new uh, starting a new center of neuroscience in, in uh, Shenzhen. 
to, to uh, recruit more new exciting young people or young talent. So today, Mingjie will share us uh, his latest uh, discovery about uh, fine structure. I'm trying to find out the uh, <laughs> talk title, but anyway, there will be it's, uh, it's on the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please feature this. Welcome, Mingjie. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Tsilong and Aaron for putting together for for let, let, letting me have this opportunity. Let me share my uh, my screen. And uh, does it work? Just a second. Yeah, great. Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's really a great pleasure to uh, be able to present the uh, work that my lab has been doing. As Tsuno has uh, indicated that I just moved, well, it's not just exactly one year ago, I moved to my current uh, position in uh, Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen called SUSTE. And we are studying a school of life Science. So with this opportunity, I would like to, uh, 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 let me see. Yeah, make uh, uh, a little bit of advertisement. We are recruiting, we are recruiting uh, many neuroscientists. The school will be recruiting another 60 faculty members uh, with, with about 15 to 20 uh, uh, faculty members in neuroscience. So it would be great if you guys can help me to I spread the news around, recommend the people to uh, our school. Now I will get into my talk. So um, phase separation is a, uh, let me see where my point will work here. Phase separation is a uh, new ways of, of uh, forming biological organelles. It is a phenomenon that it can form uh, a condensed organelle without really consuming energy. It has very unique ways in exchanging materials between a condensed phase and a dilute phase. So uh, given the extreme morphology of neurons, which are extremely compartmentalized, so phase separation is a great way for neurons to put molecules uh, in a specific place and uh, allow those molecules to form the machineries to be able to uh, form and disperse in responding to challenges, uh, stimulations, and so on and so forth. Phase separation is also a great way of uh, allowing molecules synthesized in soma to be able to uh, efficiently deliver to different regions of the neurons, or for the reverse process, turnover of the molecules. So, uh, my lab has been interested in one particular uh, uh, unit of the most, well, the most basic unit in the nervous system as uh, the contacting point between two neurons, synapse, because this is the place where two neurons talk to each other. And uh, we would like to understand how synapse form, how synapse would change uh, in response to uh, activity changes. But there are some of the fundamental questions that has not been answered. For example, uh, in the postsynaptic side of the neurons, you have a postsynaptic density, which is uh, very condensed assemblies of protein machineries responsible for receiving, interpreting, and transmitting signals released by presynaptic terminal. Now, this autonomously assembled protein assemblies attach on one side to the postsynaptic membrane, but faces to the cytoplasm. It has an extremely high concentration gradient, but it is stable. It is also dynamic, can respond to uh, synaptic stimulations. Now, how this kind of uh, structures can exist, can change upon stimulations has been really uh, not known. So my lab in the past 25 years have been trying to answer these questions. Now we, uh, 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 enter this field by trying to understand how molecules in postsynaptic density in PSD, how do they interact with each other? How do they uh, control trafficking clustering of receptors? And what are uh, neuronal activity changes? We say, we say neuronal activity changes in, in a very simplified way, for example, calcium concentration calcium concentrating oscillations would, would change the the organizations of PSD. So when we were studying two molecules, mm -hmm. two very abundant molecules, PSD95 and an enzyme, Syngap, which exist in 
almost stoichiometrically in synapse with PSD95. How do they interact? Why is synapse have such high concentrations of a thin gap? We observed a phenomenon. As it was a, they autonomously form uh, oil droplets like structure. Now, at that time, with kind of uh, surprising observations, now we realized that this is a phase separation. We think that this is probably the way that we have been looking for how PSD can autonomously form. So we proposed that uh, PSDs might be able to form via phase separation, forming a condensed phase, which uh, constantly exchanging with dilute phase, uh, uh, dilute phase in the spine uh, side of the body. So this is a very simp uh, simplistic view. We next ask, can we reconstitute the PSD? So we uh, took advantage of many years of re research that the molecules we draw here are the molecules that we have been able to purify them into very high homogeneity, and we understand how they interact with each other. On the other hand, the field has accumulated. The concentrations of these molecules, scaffold proteins, enzymes, receptors, as well as positions of these molecules in PSD. So we mix these molecules it is a physiological concentration stoichiometrics. And we try to see whether these molecules will undergo phase separation. Now, here I wanted to emphasize all the molecules interact with each other with high affinity specificity. The proteins that we study here have no intrinsically disordered sequence. I wanted to emphasize that phase separation, the driving force of phase separation is multivalent interaction. So, because the field is dominated by intrinsically disordered sequences, I do not have time to go into this uh, to explain this in to, to any of the details. Now, uh, very uh, gratifying, the full scaffold proteins, PSD95, Holmer, Schenck, GCAP, they beautifully form phase separation. Importantly, they will be able to enrich thing gap enzyme, they will be able to enrich. Uh, NR2 B tail, tetramerized NR2 B tail, meaning that it, it can cluster receptors. So these are the hallmarks of the scaffold proteins. We also reconstituted this uh, PSD platform on the supported by layer because PSDs are attached on one side to the membranes. Again, on this membrane system, those reconstituted PSD form uh, cluster uh, condensed phases. Now, importantly, this PSD uh, formation is bidirectional, can be regulated. Now, one of the regulators is an uh, immediate early gene HOMA1A, which is a monomeric form of HOMA, which massively upregulated during, for example, sleeping process. So in a preformed PSD uh, containing tetrametric HOMA, if we add HOMA1A, both in 3D solution on, on the 2D membrane, you will see dispersion of PSD, reconstituted PSD by increasing the concentration of HOMO1A. So demonstrating, uh, 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 at least providing an uh, evidence that PSD assembly via phase separation is uh, dynamic and it can be regulated. We further provided evidence that formation of excitatory PSD condensate is extremely specific. This PSD condensate, so not only does not mix with the uh, gifilin, the inhibitory uh, PSD scaffold, it actually actively repels gifilin from the PSD, showing that phase separation from the uh, PSD in excitatory synapse is extremely specific, or membraneless organelles can be extremely specific. So with this, we, 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 we uh, are more confident that uh, PSDs are likely formed by phase separation. And this PSD condensate can be uh, modulated by different forms of, of the stimulations as we uh, see in the in, in real synapse. Next, we teamed up with Roger Nicole uh, using AMPA receptor uh, trafficking by uh, stargazing, showing that phase separation mediated uh, AMPA receptor cluster is important for synaptic trafficking as well as for AMPA receptor activity in synapses. We further showed that inhibitory PSD, as I mentioned earlier on, primarily uh, formed by scaffold protein gifting, also form 
PSD. But the inhibitory PSD is dramatically different. Inhibitory PSD is a layer, a thin layer of structure instead of uh, the, the, the thickenings in the excited PSD. We also look at it into in the presynaptic uh, side of, of, of synapses. In presynaptic side of the synapses, vesicles are organized in reserve pool in uh, dark uh, pools. The reserve pool synapses can be clustered by synapsing as shown by Pietro di Camarillo's slide. We showed that active zones are a form of uh, phase separation from the organelles, which is formed by uh, REM and REM BP. The formation of this content will be able to cluster calcium channels. Therefore, uh, concentrating calcium channel, position them in uh, nearby the releasing site, controlling uh, action potential induced the release uh, uh, kinetics as well as amplitude. But uh, more interestingly, we found that synaptic vesicles, they code on the surface of the protein condensate. Now, comparing in the uh, reserved for synaptic vesicles are co activated by uh, uh, synapses. Now, this interaction is actually a form of the membrane-based organelle synaptic vesicle with membrane-less organelle protein-formed uh, 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 condensate. Now, it, it, it has meanings to, for uh, presynaptic photon uh, uh, organizations, but I think it has even more general meanings if we look into uh, cellular organizations. In living cells, we have numerous membrane-based organelles. We now also identified the field, it has identified numerous forms of biological content or membrane-less organelles. Now, our findings show that membrane-based organelles and membrane-based uh, 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 membrane organelles, they can interact in multiple ways. So allowing cells to have very broad ways of communication between these two types of uh, biological organelles. So I, I just provided a very quick recap of uh, some of the published paper in the phase separation in synapses. I wanted to use the remaining time to tell you an unpublished story, uh, how ARC regulates synaptic, synaptic plasticity uh, via phase separation, uh, work primarily done by uh, two graduate students, Bo Wenjia and Xu Zhongchen. Now, ARC is an amazing molecule. ARC immediately gets induced uh, after synaptic stimulation in a little than, uh, uh, faster than zero, uh, 30 minutes. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, common uh, uh, immediate early gene used to mark synaptic activity. ARC is uh, specifically localized in uh, certain brain regions such as the hippocampus in cortex. And uh, it's important for memory. But how ARC regulates memory is really not known. So here are some of the uh, published literature data showing that massive induction of ARC if uh, bring a neuron stimulated with uh, with, with, with activities. I, ARC INAs are located in the uh, shaft near the spine region. And uh, ARC proteins uh, can be enriched in PSDs. And uh, if ARC uh, if it level increases, m receptors get removed. So it's a negative regulator of, uh, of, 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 of uh, synaptic uh, activity. But what is actually very interesting is that uh, ARC can very precisely regulate synaptic strength. In a, in a spine, if this uh, uh, spine is active with calcium infra influx, for example, active chem kinase 2, ARC cannot go in, ARC cannot remove m receptors. But in enabling synapse, which is not activated, ARC will be able to go into spine, remove m receptors. Now, the acute form or the existing ARC protein mediated MPAR receptor removal is, can, can, can modulate the HBN forms of plasticity. If prolonged ARC induction, it will be able to regulate homeostatic scaling of the neuronal circuits. So, how ARC might be able to do such amazing, amazing uh, 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 functions of uh, removing MPAR receptors? There are some evidences because if you inhibit endocytosis, 
ACA will not, no longer be able to re remove empire receptors. So, so there is a hypothesis that ACA will be able to remove empire receptors from PSD. But we, we know that endo endocytic machineries cannot en enter PSD because the, the, the clustered empire receptors are insulated by PSD condensate. So in order to be removed, empire receptors, in order to be removed from synapse, Ample receptors would have to be dispersed from PSD condensate if ARC is involved in endocytosis. So we tested this hypothesis. So what we do is that in our uh, previously characterized uh, PSD 95 stargazing, stargazing as a proxy of ample receptor, and it will beautifully form phase separation. If we increase ARC concentration, you can disperse stargazing and the PSD uh, condensate. As a control, if the content is formed by NR2B with PSD95, ARC cannot regulate it. So it's an empire or stargazing specific dispersion by ARC. And if we use our, uh, uh, reconstitute the seven component with all the scaffold uh, folding system, same thing, ARC specifically disperse stargazing from the, from the uh, uh, reconstituted PSDs and NR2B or other scaffold to protein will not. Now we characterized the, how this might happen. It turns out to be ARC via its gag domain binds the two, two components. One is PSY motifs, one is arginine rich motifs. Now this interaction overlaps with stargazing C-terminal tail binding to PSD95. So ARC actually can antagonize uh, with PSD95, modulating PSD95, PSD95 mediated uh, phase separation clustering of ample receptors. So th these are the chemical characterization. Now, one of the motif is PSY motif here, binding to the end terminal of, 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 of ARC. This serine is phosphorylated, can be phosphorylated by uh, chemokinase 2. If this serine is phosphorylated, ARC can no longer bind to that. ARC can no longer disperse stargazing from the PSD, uh, uh, PSD clusters. This is the biochemical reasons of why ARC cannot uh, remove active uh, MPAR receptors in active synapse. Now, if we look at the uh, top family uh, 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 sequence alignment, stargazing, gamma 8, these are uh, enriched in either in hippocampus or in cortex. In other brain regions, you have PPY motif. This is not a, uh, this is not a regulated by ARC in a way correlating well with ARC uh, modulation of, of, of uh, synapse in different brain regions. Now, we know how ARC interacts with uh, stargazing. We can weaken the interaction by uh, introducing uh, neutralizing change, or we can enhance this interaction by uh, introducing more charge. And uh, if, we, if we weaken the interaction, phase separation, uh, uh, ARCA-mediated phase separation dispersion disappears. If we enhance the interaction, ARCA becomes to be more, more potent in dispersing PSD95 stargazing phase separation. Now, I introduced these two mutants because these two mutants later on, we will test them in uh, living cells. And, and I, as I said, that this theory can be phosphorylated by, by, by uh, uh, chem kinase 2. Actually, there are many series can be phosphorylated by uh, uh, chem kinase 2. So we test the one by one by one. Only when this PSY motif series gets phosphorylated in this way, in this uh, 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 panel, we use a phosphorylation mimetic mutation, S2D. It lost arc mediated dispersion. The rest of the phosphorylation does not really change, explaining that if this PSY theory is phosphorylated by chem kinase 2 uh, or inactive uh, spine, ARC cannot uh, disperse uh, stargazing or, or top ampere receptor cluster. But one of the amazing things that I do, not have, have, I do not have time to go into detail is that phase separation presents some of the very unique features compared with the dilute uh, solution chemistry. Because the affinity of ARC binding to stargazing is actually about 10 times weaker than PSD binding to stargazing. So uh, 
in, in diluted solution, you would have predicted that ARC would not be able to really uh, dispose completely with PSD95. But in condensed phase, our experimental data shows that it is highly cooperative in disposing PSD condensate compared with a simulated uh, stoichiometric interaction curve. Right? This is important because our uh, dispersion competition on the solution uh, or in, on the membrane is even uh, lower concentrate. On the supported membranes, 0 0.5 micromolar of arc is sufficient to disperse uh, stargazing PSD95 condensate. So th then we have a model. Our model is that the uh, PSD clustered amper receptor in synapse, if arc concentration increase, arc will be able to very dramatically uh, disperse AMPA receptors from the PSD to extra synapse, then facilitate the endocytosis and the removal of, 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 of arc from synapse. So does this really happen in, in neurons? So what we did is that we use uh, uh, GFP tag the stargazing and uh, arc or arc mutants. Now, if we uh, simply express GFP tag the stargazing, stargazing are uh, very highly uh, densely clustered on synapse. Expression of wider type of uh, arc, you massively downregulate the synaptic enrichment of stargazing. If you uh, eliminate arc, arc uh, uh, binding to stargazing, you also eliminate its dispersion uh, capacity. If you enhance arc interaction with stargazing, you enhance its synaptic dispersions of stargazing. But of course, this can have many different explanations because we put in uh, stargazing, we put in arc. So we thought we use even more minimal approaches that, that we have elucidated. So what we did is that we take the only the tails of cytoplasmic tail of stargazing fuse that into a single transmembrane uh, 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 helix derived from PDGFR and tagged with GFP. And we only use the gag domains of ARC and we express the, them in, in cultures. Now, uh, stargazing C-terminal tail is sufficient to be clustered in the synapse. Why uh, 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 the type of ARC would decrease this cluster? The uh, enhanced interaction of gag with, 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 uh, with, with ARC further decrease cluster. If we neutralize, uh, if we eliminate the interaction between gag and, uh, and uh, uh, arginine uh, uh, mo mo motif, then you uh, eliminate the gag domain needed dispersion. We also tested uh, whether the Phosphorylation uh, 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 now or phosphorylation mimetic mutation would respond to ARC. The S228A, it, 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 uh, it will be able to be uh, in responding to uh, gag domain expression. But if, if stargazing with S228D and the longer response to uh, ARC expression. So, with that, we uh, think that we have a model here. So the AMPA receptors can be clustered by PSD95 and downstream uh, scaffold proteins. And this interaction also uh, uh, clustering also uh, formed by phase separation. So when a synapse is activated, calcium influx activates the calcium kinase too. The PSY motif gets phosphorylated. This form of TAP is refractory to the ARC concentration increase. So in other words, it will not be responding to the arc in synapses. But in the inactive kind, uh, 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 spines, arc will be very effectively competed with PSD95, disperse AMPA receptors from the PSD uh, and then uh, facilitate uh, uh, AMPA removal in synapse, providing a mechanism of how arc might work in synapse in uh, responding to synaptic activities. And, uh, here, I would like to uh, actually, you know, uh, even though I'm in uh, uh, Cincinnati, all the work that I, I have talked about 
uh, we are done in HKUSD in Hong Kong. And I have acknowledged the people who have been doing this work. But I really wanted to uh, uh, thank uh, collaborators, uh, UH Araki and uh, Rick Huguenier's lab, and uh, my colleague, uh, 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 Guan Dong Shi, uh, in the Department of Physics on the phase separation material properties. Javier uh, Diaz Arondo uh, in Roger Nicole's lab. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> Marcelo Gonzalez in uh, Richard uh, 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 Yan's lab, uh, Reinhard Yan's lab at Max Planck Institute on the presynaptic uh, vesicle story. And of course, all the funding agency over the years in supporting our research. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Mijia, for awesome talk. It's, now it's question time. Kang, do you have a question? I see you're on mute. I probably confused everyone. <clears throat> Kong definitely has a question. Yeah, I believe so. Hi. Hi. Let me yeah. maybe yeah. I can. Ah, uh, sure. Ask a Sound, please. Um, hey. So. Fascinating. So you start, okay, so it, it's a little fast. So um, one thing is you started talking about LTP and homeostatic plasticity, and then you ended with LTP. So, <laughs> so, so, this, so I think it's really cool that ARC, depending on calcium concentration, can do one of the two things. So like maybe mechanistic, do you think the dispersion is um, moving alongside, like uh, on the membrane, or do they drop off the membrane? Uh, I mean, do oh. they inter internalize? And also, uh, maybe if you can expand a little bit on your last slide of mm -hmm. how depending on calcium co concentration are can do the two different things. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I know I, I've been going through quite fast. <clears throat> so, so in uh, in 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 inactive uh, spine, uh, chem kinase is not active. So uh, arc will be able to enter uh, PSD. Enter PSD then allow ARC to compete with PSD-95 to disperse uh, the top-mediated emperor receptor cluster. Right, so we're using active uh, uh, kinase. Uh, for formulation of the serine on the PSD-1 motif will disrupt ARC's binding with stargazing with stag attack. So it will not be uh, able to disperse uh, 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 But earlier on, uh, there was a beautiful study from uh, 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 Hirano's lab in, in, in Japan. The inactive synapse, chem kinase to beta, can act as a, as a scaffold to sequester arc. So, there are a double insurance mechanism of inactive uh, kinase, ARC, will not be able to uh, get access to the MR receptor. So basically, the calcium switches the, so, so the, the activate chem kinase determines the subcellular localization of ARC. Yeah, yeah, you can say that, oh. right? yes, yeah. And so do they go, uh, do they move along the membrane or do they come down? They, 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 uh, that, that is uh, the def definitive answer is not known, but there are evidences that if you uh, inhibit endocytosis, even if ARC is increased, you would not be able to remove uh, uh, MPA receptor from, from synapse. So, so uh, it, it should move to uh, extra synapse uh, membrane. Oh, thank you. Very good. Now, uh, two, two people raise a hand. Uh, first, Cao Mian, please. Want to ask a question? I mean, yes. Hey, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah, I have a general question. So you demonstrate very nicely the phase separation in both excitatory and inhibitory synapses. I wonder how about the neuromodulatory synapses like the dopamine system? Do they also have ah. this kind of mm, mm, mm. Uh, the, 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 the answer is no, we have not looked at it. I don't think anyone else has looked at it, uh, the, 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 the synapse. The only other one, Recently, it has been shown in neuromuscular junction. It also forms by mailing's lab. It also forms the phase separation uh, by, by resting mediated acetylcholine receptor cluster. So, both pre and post synaptic, you have this phase separation. 
a pre a present app present apps mainly looking at the the uh, molecules uh, 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 modulating the synaptic vesicle uh, clustering and uh, uh, transporting uh, can has a beautiful paper uh, uh, in uh, on this line and as well as the synaptic uh, uh, transmitter release machineries they all involve phase separation different forms of phase separation thanks okay next question uh, Rachel hi great talk hi. I listened to your uh, symposium this morning at SFN, uh, and so I was uh, really excited to hear more about your talk and, and your work you. in greater detail. Um, so I have a question about if ARC interacts with other type of TARPs, and if you think this might be playing a role in amper receptor subunits' roles in synaptic transmission or plasticity. Mm, uh, great question. So we look at it interactions of ARC with these isoforms that I, uh, I don't know whether you, can, you, you probably cannot. Okay, I, I said, we, it interacts with stargazing gamma-8, uh, gamma-4, but it does not interact with gamma-3. Yeah, it, it binds to gamma-8 with even stronger affinity with uh, than stargazing. So it is even more uh, uh, efficient in sort of dispersing gamma-8 containing uh, TAPs from PSD. Interesting, thank you. Mm. Ming, Ming Jie, can you hear me? Hey, yeah. 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 Uh, mm -hmm. Hi, sorry, I had a little bit of a technical problem. So uh, great talk and it was very, um, interesting to see how the you can reconstitute active zones with the uh, rim rim bp and then uh, vesicles so mm -hmm. uh, i so i wonder um so so in the knockout of rim and rim bp right mm -hmm. the synaptic uh, release has been greatly reduced um, however, if you look at the synapse as a structure, right, mm -hmm. both the active zones and the, mm -hmm. the large, very large reserve pools are still mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So, so do, you, do you envision there are other proteins? Uh, I mean, we've been wondering about how the CIT2 or Liprin phase separation intersect with, the, with these active zone, very you know, obviously critical RIM, RIM BP uh, phase separation. Have, have, you, have you had any more thoughts on that? Yeah, this is really uh, a wonderful question. So, uh, based on I think uh, uh, your, your, your in, in 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 mammals, if removing all rim and rim BP, the mm -hmm. active zone layer uh, more or less disappears. Mm -hmm. But uh, but uh, 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 active zone contain many more proteins like uh, 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 liprins, like. Uh, 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 RPTPs, and they actually can come compensate at least biochemically. So we look at it into all these proteins, we'll be able to form uh, active uh, zone-like condenses. But these condenses, the way that uh, vesicles interacting with them are different. They can form phase separation, but they uh, cannot interact with synaptic vesicles in a way that like a, a run run BP containing uh, contact rate. I see, so, that makes sense because functionally yeah. they are defective for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, great, thanks, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, for uh, so, uh, uh, limited time, there are three, also three questions on the chat board. So Minjie, could you also uh, briefly type that, uh, answer the question on the chat board while we have the uh, 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 so uh, uh, next talk? Okay, great, thanks. Great talk, thanks. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. We'll, do, we'll do a second talk. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mingjia. And um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker today, uh, Dr. Susan Ackerman. Uh, Dr. Ackerman is a professor of cellular and molecular medicine at UCSD. And um, she received her undergraduate degree at Chico State in California, uh, in Northern California and uh, then did a PhD uh, at UCLA and then postdoctoral fellowship at University of Illinois and uh, the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia. She then um, started her own laboratory at the uh, Jackson Laboratory. And here is where she started identifying um, spontaneous mouse mutants that had interesting phenotypes and then using mouse genetics to discover the genes that were mutated that caused those phenotypes. 
this has led, led her to discover many genes involved in the development of the cerebellum. And uh, she, in, this included the discovery of a gene encoding the netrin receptor, um, UNC5C. And her, her lab has pioneered and uh, Sue has pioneered using the natural variation that's present in uh, different inbred mouse strains to not only discover new and unexpected genes that, uh, but also to work out the mechanisms using biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, her most recent work is taking this to the next level by identifying modifier genes in mouse. Um, these are things that we use simple model systems like yeast and worms and flies to do because we can't do it in mouse, but Sue can do it and she does it and finds modifier genes using forward mouse genetics. She's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences and she's a HHMI investigator. She's a tremendously inspiring scientist and colleague and it's a great honor to welcome her to hear her latest. Thanks, Sue. Thanks so much, Aaron, for the really nice introduction. I'm going to share um, my screen here. It all looks okay? Looks good. Okay. Um, as as um, Aaron told you, we've been using forward genetics for many years um, to, to really understand um, CNS development, but as well to find recessive mutations that can cause neurodegeneration. And we're not doing these large screens anymore, but we've kind of switched to something that is a lot harder, it's true, but to use the um, natural occurring um, of variation, as you heard about in uh, various inbred strains of mice, and there's dozens, to actually change the phenotype of a particular primary mutation and then um, identify using forward genetics this modifier. So, what I want to um, let me see. It, it, do today is just tell you one one story really how the modifier has we think um, opened a, a new area for research and I'm going to start with um, a paper that was published some time ago but it it began with this one ENU chemically induced mutation in mice mice that were homozygous for this mutation that we called NMF205 um, before we knew what the gene was, developed ataxia. And the ataxia was concomitant with the loss of granule cells in the cerebellum. And you can see there's a traumatic um, switch here for these loss of granule cells between three weeks and one month of age. By two months of age, virtually all granule cells had degenerated. And um, these mice really don't sur survive past that time. They have additional areas of neurodegeneration in the cortex, hippocampus, and retina. So we, we um, identified the mutation in these mice as a loss of function mutation in GTP binding protein 2. There was no known function for this gene. There were no papers on it. but we could see that domains um, suggested it was a GTPase that had high homology to EF1A or EFTU in bacteria. This is the um, protein that brings charged tRNAs to the ribosome. And it also had homology to two other translational GTPases, ERF3, release factor 3, which um, is involved in recycling of ribosomes um, at canonical stop codons, and HBS1, like a GTPase involved in no-go decay. So it, we were, um, I wouldn't say pleased, but we um, could see the importance of this mutation now that subsequent to our work, many families have been identified with mutations in GTP-BB2. They have much of the same 
phenotypes, morphological phenotypes seen in the mice, you can see here um, there's a dramatic cerebellar atrophy or hypoplasia, as well as they have retinal abnormalities. And in the phenotypes between families are variable. In some cases, there's microcephaly, corpus callosum genesis, and delayed um, development as well. So we really didn't know what the function of this, of this gene. Um, and we learned a lot by looking for modifier genes of the original GTP BP2 mutation. We found um, the, the original mutation, our screen was done on C57 black 6 j mice, the most commonly used inbred strain. And we found when we crossed our mutant mice with several other strains, the attenu uh, neurodegeneration was greatly attenuated. And we could map the modifier to distal chromosome one. So I'm just showing you valve here, but this was true in many strains. And um, you can see that the, by um, morphology, the cerebellum is much rescued compared at six months compared to two months of age. This is true of many other sites of neurodegeneration as well. And we were able to um, identify the modifier gene, although there were 10,000, just to give you an idea of the sort of variation that these different strains can have, we were able to map it to three megabases. There were 10,000 SNPs within three megabases between valve and black 6 j We could show that black 6 j mice have a mutation in the T-stem loop of a tRNA um, called NTR20. It encodes an arginine UCU tRNA. This mutation leads to a um, partial block of processing so that there's much um, lower levels uh, here shown on this northern blot of mature tRNA for um, NTR20 compared to its cousin, black 6 n I think many people think of these mice as interchangeable. I'm gonna show you that you shouldn't do that. And also valve. And we see that there is an increase in the unprocessed form of this gene in black 6 j And we could show that we had the right gene by putting wild type NTR20 back into our mutant mice and see that we greatly attenuated neurodegeneration. So the puzzle for us um, was and continues to be the fact that eukaryotes, in particular, higher eukaryotes, have hundreds of nuclear encoded tRNA genes. And we only really need to decode because of wobble about 50 um, uh, codons. So this would suggest that there should be enormous redundancy between um, members of uh, genes encoding tRNAs with the same anti-codon. And in fact, even for this particular family, this should have been the case. Here are the five members of tRNA arginine UCU. I'm showing you here NTR20 that had the mutation. These do have some SNPs um, within the um, base of the tRNA but they all have the same anticodon and they all should encode functional tRNAs. So why don't these other four tRNAs um, rescue, compensate for the loss of NTR, partial loss of NTR20? Well, surprisingly, it's because NTR20 is the first tissue specific tRNA that um, we know of and we've shown here that it's expressed only in um, the CNS. The same is true for the human homolog as well. And 
it's not only tissue specific, it's very predominantly ex expressed within this um, family of UCU arginine tRNAs so that the loss of mature tRNA and black 6 j leads to an over 60% loss of the pool of tRNAs encoded by all of these genes. So in addition to being brain specific or, and retina um, as, as well, we can call it part of the brain, um, it is largely only expressed in neurons. And uh, here I'm showing you base scope in situ. And you can see that it's expressed in both excitatory and inhibitory neurons. So this all led to a working model that we were really excited about um, that impaired processing of NTR20 in the black 6 j mass leads to a dramatic reduction in the pool of this particular tRNA um, um, family. And this then is gonna lead to transient stalls uh, when ribosomes hit AGA codons, because they're waiting for um, the proper charged tRNA to come in, GTP BP2 then um, appears to be a ribosome rescue factor. And I should say this model was, I'm not showing you, but um, came about by doing ribosome profiling on a variety of different genotypes of the cerebellum. So um, this really identified the first tRNA with um, had a mutation that could act epistatically in higher eukaryotes to cause a phenotype. And also it was the modifier that led to a mechanistic um, uh, underlying mechanism for loss of GTP BP2 and showed that ribosome stalling could indeed lead to neurodegeneration, something we didn't know about. So now I just want to switch to our work on tRNAs, and um, we will um, uh, focus on those. Oh, I do want to um, uh, mention that we've also identified a family member, GTP BP2, GTP BP1 that also acts as a ribosome um, rescue factor in a tRNA dependent manner. Okay, so we were really excited about the possibility that tRNA mutations themselves could lead to, we thought potentially, um, to phenotypes in a non-epistatic um, way. And we could look at distal chromosome um, one in the mouse where NTR20 resides. And this is the most rich region in the mouse genome for quantitative trait loci for non-mouse geneticists. You can think about these as um, GWAS. And when we looked closer at the various traits that have been mapped there, we found that many were um, neuronal um, or neurobehavioral that made us think maybe NTR20 or tRNA could be involved in um, a function of some of these traits. We focused on seizure susceptibility because it's um, really quantitative compared to um, the other traits. But I want to point out, while we were asking um, whether NTR20, the tRNA mutation in black 6 j could be involved in seizure susceptibility, this peak for QTL is quite broad with 140 genes underlying it, and many better candidates reside, uh, resided within there, um, some of which I'm showing here. Nonetheless, we went on and tested this. We knew black 6 j mice, it's been known for quite a while, have a very high seizure threshold. So we asked them if we change the tRNA expression level 
of wild type tRNA, can we modify seizure threshold? And we did this in multiple ways. I'm just showing you the electroconvulsive um, threshold, which is the amount of amperage that you need to induce a um, seizure, a tonic-clonic seizure. And you can see that when we express wild type levels of tRNA, we lower the seizure threshold back towards what most um, strains has. This also appears to be a loss of function because if we completely take out the tRNA in the black 6 j background, so there's no aberrant tRNAs um, expressed, we still have a high seizure threshold. We can do the exact same thing, but this time take, use black 6 n the cousin, and knock out um, NTR20. And when we take out NTR20, we see an increase in seizure threshold, as we saw on black 6 j and again, we can overexpress the mutant tRNA on the black 6 m background that has no effect. So it is loss of function. So seizure threshold isn't seizures, but it made us think that perhaps this tRNA expression levels could act to modify epilepsy in mouse models. And we um, focused on this one model. Um, it's a mouse with a point mutation, a, a GABA receptor gamma 2. And this is a mutation that has been seen in children. But we wanted to focus on this because even in kids with, that are heterozygous for this mutation, only 20% of them develop spike wave discharges and 65% have febrile seizures. So this really suggested to us that maybe this is a phenotype that could be um, modified genetically. And to test this, we made use of Steve Petro had made the um, knock mutation on um, the black 6 j background previously, and in his hands and in our hands, looking at um, performing EEG, looking at spike wave discharges, potted per hour here, there were very few spike wave discharges. However, if we express back the wild type levels of NTR20, we now raise the number of spike wave discharges, showing that this indeed is a, a good model of um, epilepsy on when the tRNA levels have been changed. So cellularly, we performed a number of EFIS experiments in um, slices patch clamping, and I'm only gonna show you one, they all were um, recently published, but um, I'm, this particular um, change uh, in the mini IPSC um, frequency was seen in both gen uh, genetic backgrounds, black 6 j as well as black 6 n and, and you can see that the loss of NTR20 really um, alters the spontaneous inhibitory um, transmission here. And I think it's really quite clear from the, uh, the traces as well. So how is this working? What's, uh, what's the mechanism for this? And um, one thing that we thought about were, was signaling pathways. And we have previously shown that in the double mutant, the tRNA with GTP BP2 mutation, where we have a dramatic increase in stalled ribosomes, we alter the initiation pathway um, known as the integrated stress response. And this is um, leading to a phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha. We could show that the kinase that was involved 
in this case was GCN2. There's four, three others in mammals. And um, that uh, when GCN2 is activated by stalled ribosomes, as you would expect, you get a phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha, which is going to block initiation but you also have an increase in ATF4 translation, which leads to increased transcription of target genes. We could show this was neuroprotective in this particular model. So does tRNA mutation alone lead to the ISR? And the answer is yes. Um, you can see that there is a dramatic increase in EIF2 alpha phosphorylation. But I'm not showing you the data here, but if we look at the GCN2 mutant, again, GCN2 is the kinase involved here, we see no change in um, many iPSCs in, um, in those mice. So it suggested to us that while this is changing, it may not be the main contributor to the change in synaptic um, alterations. We also um, looked genomically and we looked at translational efficiency within the hippocampus. So this would allow us to um, map the number of ribosome reads um, that we see on a given transcript over the amount of RNA. And we saw that there was a dramatic decrease in translational efficiency of some genes. Some also went up, but we noticed um, that many of these genes were mTORC1 targets that were changing suggesting that mTOR is changing upon tRNA um, deletion. And so mTOR, as um, most of you likely know, is a kinase that um, regulates mRNA translation, this time in a positive fashion, via phosphorylation of um, S6 kinase, which in turn phosphorylates the ribosome protein S6. And indeed, we see by um, Western that there is a um, decrease in mTORC1 activity upon loss of NTR20. Does this do anything to synaptic function? Well, we know, of course, um, mTORC1 um, can affect um, excitatory um, synaptic function. We saw that too when we treated mice with rapamycin. But what we also see is that when we treat wild-type mice, black 6 m mice with rapamycin, the inhibitor of um, mTORC, that we see a um, increase in um, frequency as well as amplitude um, of many iPSCs. And I should say in the black 6 m background, the amplitude did also go up in the loss of NTR20. So this suggests to us that changes in mTOR may be contributing to these changes in um, electrophysiology and ultimately seizure threshold that we see. So um, we're Pushing hard in this area now, we're very interested in the variants in tRNAs that all of us have. There's many of them, but you can't look, unlike proteins, it's very difficult to know which ones are going to cause any change in function of a tRNA. And we even have variants among us that, um, or at least in the, uh, the population that occur in NTR20 itself, even including the one we found in, in mice. So we're asking now, can these various um, variants change either epistatically or non-epistatically neurological phenotypes and um, neuron function? And we're working um, very hard on um, a cell atlas in the nervous system of the tRNAs and different um, families, their expression level. It's not 
um, trivial to do this by RNA seq because of the many modifications that occur in these genes. So um, with that, I'd um, like to um, acknowledge the people in my lab. Archon Gangley was a former postdoc who recently left at all of the EFIS, much of which I didn't have time to show you. Mridu Kapoor did all of these other work on the um, tRNAs. Um, Gabernaj and Ruta Shimura started these projects with their study of GTP BP2 and um, identification of the modifier. Wayne Frankel did the EEGs for us, and we had some computational help, um, much appreciated from Scott Adamson and Jeff Chuang and our funding sources. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. And we have time for questions. Um, Sean? Yes, please. Um, hi, Sue. Great, hi, Sean. Um, so, how, so I've never, so how come, you said it's hard to figure out the function from the mutations, so maybe can we get some clues from human mutations? Um, like of the brain diseases related, uh, human disease, uh, hum, um, human brain diseases, um, how much of, are there a large number of them that map like the SMPs look like they map to the right side? And also yeah. how many RNAs are brain specific, if you have them? Okay, so for the first part, um, that's exactly what we're trying to do. But so far, um, people have completely overlooked the tRNAs because of proposed redundancy and the fact that um, we can't easily look at expression levels. So we, um, and it's complicated that we think in most cases they're going to work epistatically to modify um, neurological diseases. And um, we can't easily study modifiers in human populations yet. We don't have the sample sizes typically. So um, we're hoping we will be, um, we're going to be um, making IPSC and um, iNeuron um, mutations as well as mice with this. Brain specific, um, they, these can fluctuate um, dramatically, even between, I didn't have time to show you, but if you compare granule cells to Purkinje cells, the the usage, the repertoire of tRNAs is dramatically different. Um, and new genes, new tRNAs are expressed in, or are used in Purkinje cells that are never used in granule cells. That we're now looking at um, a variety of neuron types um, in vivo. This is from um, mouse using a um, unconditional epitope tagged mouse that we've made. And we also um, find differences in astrocytes, um, microglia, you know, there is um, almost any, any cell type. So this is gonna be really important to know where to hunt for these mutations as well. There does, um, we found at least one more brain specific one, but we don't know which neuron type, the cell type it's in yet. Thank you. Um, Judith Friedman, do you want to ask your question? Let's see if she can, all right. Um, if not, I can, I can read her question. This is from um, Judith Friedman from, <laughs> Uh, Stanford. So um, how do you distinguish global effects such as stalling or stress from loss of function for a single or master protein, e.g. loss, less translation, RQC mediated degradation, et cetera? Right. So, so the first thing that we would have thought about was that um, Maybe there were genes that were specifically, or transcripts that were specifically enriched in AGA codons. 
that are necessary for granule cell homeostasis. And um, this idea of codon usage could change between, um, between different um, cell types, for example, or even developmentally. We don't see this when we look at granule cells themselves. So we felt that there might be something more global than, um, and that's uh, how we uh, found the ISR activation. We're re-looking at this again now and um, synaptosomes to make sure that we're right there and it may be different. And so we're going to have to go back and check and see if we see anything um, in terms of stalling and unenriched codons or levels of a protein. Okay. And the um, head of the brain initiative and the cell census consortium, John Nye is here, so maybe we can convince him to include tRNAs in the next round of making cell atlases. Um, Applications so are due tomorrow. <laughs> Thank so, you. So question, um, Marcus Lee, I think it's an important question that I had to leave out. Um, how do you think NTR20 is modulate, modulated and there's tRNA fragments and synaptic vesicles? So we do we think um, there's different species of this um, molecule? And um, there's a lot of interest in fragments of tRNAs. I can tell you in this case, we don't think it's um, due to fragments. What I didn't show you is that we could rescue the um, high seizure threshold by overexpressing other tRNAs of the same family. So that really argues against a um, specific fragment um, that may be modulating this. Okay. Any other questions? I do. Maybe I, I'll ask one more question uh, regarding yeah. amazing. Uh, so mutation, would, would you be think about uh, would human mutation associated with tRNA? Uh, would they be on, under a stronger or weaker uh, evolution pressure uh, comparing to the uh, coding sequence uh, variations? Because the coding sequence is affect the protein structures, but uh, would you be predicting there will be some uh, undiscovery? Uh, TRN variations ha normally happen in normal people and occasionally cause some these disorders. Right. Um, there's only been one tRNA that's been um, found in, in a single person, selenocysteine um, tRNA, but there's only one copy of it. So we don't have an idea of anything else. What there does appear to be is within the tRNA itself, there's there are variants, right? We don't know what they're doing, but they are um, uh, less variants within the body of tRNAs than there. And you could argue, are they selected against perhaps, right? Perhaps, but it would matter on what cell type and what the outcome is. Um, but upstream of the um, tRNA, there's more changes in the human population substantially more. And we've cloned um, a second modifier of, uh, of this, this gene. And we found now it's upstream sequences in a different tRNA. So I didn't have time to show you all of that, but I think it really points to these things are gonna play a role in modulating um, disease. Great, thanks. So, Sue, so you said um, right now there's you don't have enough samples to do this type of thing in human. But what would that experiment look like to find that you would to find these types of modifiers in human or like a T well, perhaps a tRNA uh, variations? Well, I think you would really have to first have enough. Uh, what what um, 
It depends on the disease, right? But if you're looking for a genetic disease, which is what we would like, and then um, it would be nice to have it with the same allele, but okay, let's just take a loss of function allele. So then you really need um, a reasonable enough sample size for those patients that you also could um, have whole genome sequencing as well. It, it could be done, but I think back to like the Huntington modifier that took 20 years of the whole world putting all their patients together, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it might be easier to go back um, once we have an idea of which ones to look for too, and which cell type, which is this last question what regulates the expression um, of different repertoires? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we're looking at that right now. I think there's gonna be a variety of things that do. We're looking to see if it's activity dependent. Um, I don't think most of them will be, but in some cases, maybe, but we have no evidence for that yet. We're still looking, but... Um, we do think, you know, tRNAs, the, uh, the promoters are within the tRNA themselves, and they do not change from gene to gene within a family. So this really suggests that it's going to be um, upstream or downstream regions. Okay. That looks like all the questions. Thanks so much, Stu. Really exciting work. Great. Bye. Bye. Thanks so yes. much. Okay. Uh, Mingjet took took off. Yeah, so thanks. Thanks everyone. See you again.